like what we will be presenting to you this morning. I'm calling this no condemnation, period. No condemnation, period. This is an astounding message. I mean, it's, it's astounding. In about 57 AD, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a young Roman church. The conditions in Rome at that time were rel relatively peaceful, simply because Nero had not st started all his uh, persecution and killing Christians and the terrible things that happened during his reign. Paul had not yet been to Rome when he wrote, when he wrote about the Roman to the Romans, but he had greeted, he greeted 26 different people by name in the book, people he'd never met before. So unlike a lot of his other epistles uh, that where he would deliver a lot of corrections to the churches that he wrote to, and in that, I want you to remember, Paul addressed things head on. I mean, he didn't back up. If something wasn't right or something wasn't going right or somebody was not doing what they should have been doing, uh, he would hit it head on Amen. every single time. Now, they didn't like him a whole bunch because of it, but he did it. And he was always, always, you know, pointing out heresies, pointing out what people should be doing with their lives, how they should be living how they should not be causing divisions in the church and how they should not be teaching different things than what the Lord had led him to teach and the revelations that had been given to him. I mean, he, he pointed all those things out all the time. He was always talking about the immaturity of the church in di um, many different areas and would say, you know, I would like to tell you more, but I can't tell you anymore. I would like to give you some strong meat, but my goodness gracious, you can't even drink the milk I'm giving you. You know, so he, he was right on about so many things. And so uh, he, he, would, he would just let it rip, so to speak, about the truth of where we should walk with the Lord and the truth of where we should be with the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's a serious walk. And the devil would do anything at any point, any time, to get anybody sidetracked at any way that they possibly could. Good. Remember, good always gets in the way of best. There are a lot of good things, but uh, if the Lord doesn't have you going a certain direction, you decide to come up with a direction yourself, then that becomes good, and you miss best. And God always points us in the line of, of best. So he was concerned about one major issue, and that is that this new congregation of believers should have a clear uncompromising understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his main concern. So the primary running thing through Paul's letter to the, Roman, to the Romans is the revelation of God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and, and his righteousness in the plan of salvation, what the Bible calls the gospel. You and I know this verse so well, Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. This is, of course, Paul, where he's stating this wonderful statement. I'm not ashamed, he says, of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, for, it is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. Now, from the beginning of the letter, Paul would steadily, was always pointing out, uh, matter of fact, the sinfulness of man. And by the time he comes to the eighth chapter of Romans, and where we're going to camp out at some today, we have to go through chapter seven. Now, chapter seven is depressing. Now, you have to admit it is very depressing. And if you, like I have through the years, try to read all these theologians and trying to keep up with what they thought chapter seven was about, it is absolutely ridiculous. So let me just go up and just say this right up front. Uh, there is anguish and there is all kind of desperation and everything else in what, when Paul begins to talk in chapter seven of Roman. He talks in detail about the sinfulness of man. 
He elaborates about his own weaknesses and his own inadequacies. He confesses his utter inability to do what he wants to do. Have you ever been there? Yeah. I mean, he wants to do it, but he can't do it. Look at Romans seven nineteen. This is what Paul says. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. As I said, it's kind of depressing, chapter 7, when you really look at it. The words me and I appear more than 19 times in that book, in that chapter, right by itself. And Paul is utterly and completely focused on himself in chapter 7. We should say, glory, hallelujah, I've camped out in 7. Come on, we've all been there. We've all done that. Every single one of us have. We all have been me, 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 I, 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 I. And so he then, he begins to lament until he get to the climax in verse 24, 724. He said, wretched man that I am, dear Lord God, have I not cried that out to the Lord before? I have. Maybe you never have. I said, oh, dear God, <laughs> who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. He, what he's really saying is, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Actually, this is Paul's testimony, his personal testimony of his spiritual journey. That's what chapter 7 is really about. Pharisee of Pharisees that he was. You know, he said that himself in Acts 26, 5. He says he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He is very blunt in saying he's, was his frustrating inability to be holy and righteous. And he declares that he kept the Torah. He says he kept every single bit of it. Read it. You'll see it. Then suddenly, out of the depths of his despair, Paul cries out, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he follows with the cry of Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Glory yes. to God. He's talking about me. Yes. Woo. Every hand in here should be going up. He's, tra that, that, he's talking about me. Glory to God. Now, let me help you understand. You know, juxtaposed against his derail frustration in the previous verses, you should envision Paul shouting just as loud as he could shout, ah, no condemnation. Amen. Wow, that is, that is something. Say it with me, no condemnation. No condemnation. Oh, when I finish this, you go be shouting. Yes. No condemnation. So, what a welcome revelation this was to Paul after, you know, plodding through chapter 7 and giving us his personal testimony and talking about all the chains of bondage that he had been in. Now, I want to, you know, make a public confession. I've been in chains of bondage. And you know, uh, every one of you have been in chains of bondage. Everybody in here should be on your way to hell except for Jesus. All of us. I don't care how much you look, well you look now, how washed and cleaned up you are, and how pretty and how lovely you smell. I want to tell you right now, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, hell is where we were headed. Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to the Lord God Almighty. Whoa, thank you, Lord. And until you learn to say that from the depths of your being, until you begin to actually believe that hell had a place for you, and it was set aside with your name over the door, and they were justified in bringing you there apart from Jesus, until you deal with that, my friend, you will never be able to praise him the way he should be praised. You will never be able to. But see, we live in a society where we think, you know, oh, well, you know, it's all right. Well, glory to God, I've been going to church all my life. Well, honey, church don't keep you out of hell. I'm telling 
only a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing him, loving him, inviting him into your life, believing he is the son of the living God, believe that he has set you free, believing he died on the cross for you personally, rose from the grave and personally resurrected you. And unless you believe that, you're still on your way to hell. Glory to God. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Wow. Mm. James writes and he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Yes, it did. Glory to God. What a massive shift from the bondage of chapter seven. I can't do anything, you know, I'm just, who can help me? When you come to chapter eight, from the I and the me that you find out in Romans seven, Paul now begins to explosively, I mean, he is so excited about what God has done, just like you ought to be. When he says, there is now, there's therefore now, Excuse me. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For there is therefore now. 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 Because of Jesus. Of what Jesus did. And because I chose him as my Lord and Savior. Now let me just say something real fast here. Just because Jesus made a way for people not to go to hell does not mean people are not going to go to hell. I mean, let me lay it out in case Jesus comes tomorrow and I'll have a chance to tell you again. I mean, he may come today. I mean, he may. And so I want to get it all out. Hallelujah. And let you understand the price has been paid for you. But until you receive it and make it your own, it don't work for you. It is a personal relationship. It is an invitation by you to the Son of God to come into your life yes. Yes. that you, you invite him in. Your mama didn't invite him in for you. Your daddy didn't invite him in for you. Your grandmom and your granddaddy didn't invite him in for you. Your husband or your wife didn't invite him in for you. You invited him into your life and received him as your Lord and Savior when you did that, hell had to loose you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, there's something right here. Let me take time for you to understand. It's very important that you see this. Because if you're reading from a King James Version, in other words, the one that Jesus used. If you're reading from a King James Version of the Bible, you know, we have new people all the time, and I understand that some of you may think Jesus used that one. He did not. So, if you're reading from a King James or the New King James Version, if anybody in here is reading from, from either of those, Romans 8, 1 adds another phrase to this verse that is not in the original. Right. Now, let me help you out. This is what the New King James and the King James says. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, but they add this part, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That is not in the original Greek. Now you better listen because it makes a humongous difference. It's not any little something. Stay with me. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. That in chapter 8 verse 1 is not there. No need to stare at me. Stay with me. So the NASB, the ESV, the uh, NLT, New Living, all those, all of them leave out that last phrase. Right. Right. 
Why? It is not in the original Greek. In the original Greek, it simply says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Now, I'm going to help you with it. Then you'll shout a little louder than you are right now. All right. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Now, that, that did not put period on there. I'm putting period on there. So, you know, no, so the Greek says period. No, it does not say period. I said period over and out. Got it? Yes. Now, let me help you. There's no qualifying phrase after Christ Jesus in the original Greek. The earliest manuscripts, translations, and citations in the early church writings dating all the way back to the 4th and 5th century all reflect the shorter version of this verse. Jesus died... He hadn't been dead that long by the time you get to the fourth and fifth. Are you with me? Now I'm going to tell you ahead of time. If you research this for yourself on the internet, you're going to find opposing views. Scholars who are strict adherents to the King James, and dear God, there are a lot of them, and I've met most of them <laughs> through the years. You know, I'm being just not really serious, but... I feel like I've met them because they all told me I couldn't do what I'm doing. So let me come on back here. I guess, Lord, let me stay with the program. Okay, here we go. Now, you're going to find opposing views. Scholars who are strict adherents to the King James will argue this point, but the Greek stands on its own merit. Amen. Now, why is this important? Because if that extra phrase is there, it makes you look at yourself. When in reality, you should be looking at Jesus and celebrating what he has provided for you. That's why it's so important. Because if you leave it in there, then you move into works to take care of you. Are you with me? Some of you look like you've got to go out the door. The door's a lot. Forget it. Now, now, what matters here is not the argument of some, but the profound reality of this verse in its original language. I'll say it again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, none, case closed, period. Amen. Now, I know if you're looking at your King James right now, and that's all you've ever looked at because you want to be accurate, there are an awful lot of things that are not accurate there. And we could go in deep discussion about it. But we're going to stay on this one for right now. Okay. Now, you just need to loosen up a minute. So if you're sitting there with a King James, and, I, and that doesn't mean you can't teach from the King James. It just means you need to know what you're talking about. Yes. So I've taught from King James for years. I've taught from the New King James for years. But here... They are wrong. Yes. Now, listen to me. Again, that extra phrase makes you look at yourself. Yes. It makes you, who walk not after the flesh, it puts it back on you. Who walks not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The Lord is not looking at you to make the decision whether he condemns something or not. His blood either covered you or it did not. Now, I'm going to give you four reasons 
why our salvation is absolutely secure in Jesus Christ. Number one, no condemnation means no punishment. That requires another shout. You need to get this. No condemnation means no punishment. Jesus took the punishment. Now, there was a punishment. He took it. All of it. He did not leave any of it for you. I'm going to say it again because people are kind of staring at me by now. No condemnation from the Lord Jesus Christ means no punishment from him. At any time, any place, under any condition. Now hang in here with me before you start trying to light the fire and call me a heretic. <laughs> Stay with me. Okay. There's no comma after Christ Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that you can live in some kind of crazy way. All right. All right. What it does mean is that though we sin, though we make mistakes, though we fail and reap the consequences of our failures, Nevertheless, there's no condemnation from the Lord. The problem is we don't understand consequences and condemnation. The Lord doesn't send the consequences. Write this on the tablet of your heart. The Lord doesn't send the consequences of our sins. We create them. And we have to deal with consequences of our sins. Are you with me? But there is no condemnation from the Lord. Because he paid the price. Stay with me, you'll get it. The wonderful, is new, the wonderful news is that we will be convicted of sin, but never condemned when we repent. The Holy Spirit will convict you of sin, but the Lord will not condemn you because of it. There's a big difference there. There's a big difference. The Lord in his outstanding mercy throws our sin into the sea of forgetfulness, it says. And he says he never remembers them again. Hallelujah. Now, no condemnation, no denunciation. I decided to look up the word denunciation. Because I thought, I kind of half know what that means. But if I kind of half know what it means, that means you probably about know about half what it means too. I looked it up. No condemnation, no denunciation. No condemnation means no censorship, no punishment, no disapproval. None of that from the Lord. No denunciation, none from the Lord which means no public uh, informing, no public common, uh, condemnation, no informing, period. In other words, God's not going to squeal on his kids. You better be shouting. Now, let me tell you, because I've said this before, because I was told that when I got to heaven, there was a video. And it, my life was going to be scrolled for the whole world to see. Well, who wants to go to heaven and see that? <laughs> Hello, church. Amen. See, I'm now understanding why some of you are not too happy about Jesus coming. <laughs> but if you really understand 
no condemnation, no denunciation, no exposure. What do we say? Come, Lord Jesus. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Woo, I'm ready to go. And will never, nor will you, face any sin in your life. Lord have mercy. Abraham lied about his wife twice. There were consequences. David committed murder and adultery. There was consequences. Peter rebuked the Lord and denied him as well. There were consequences. Paul and Barnabas argued fiercely about John Mark. There were consequences, a broken relationship. But nowhere in the word of God are, there any, are any of these men ever condemned by the Lord. You might as well go ahead and say it. Wow. Wow. Because if there was a good chance to say something, I would think what I just pointed out would be a good time to say something. Wouldn't you? So, convicted so that you and I will repent. Yes. The Holy Spirit will convict us. Yes. But so that we can be condemned. No. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, church, we will never stand condemned because of the blood of Jesus, which was shed for you. His blood took care of it. Now, do you know that I know just as well as you that there are people that don't even know how to live their life without being bogged down in guilt? And when you try to get them out from under it, they get mad. Like there might be some even in here today or even watching, you're about to get kind of mad. Because you're not going to be condemned. Because you lived your whole life as a poor, pitiful victim. And you've gotten all of your little sugar plums as a result of it. Hello. Well, I'll just move right along. Now, our sins have been paid for. Jesus took the punishment and listen carefully. No sin is paid for twice. Uh-huh. Amen. That's right. That's right. Yes. You should understand that. That's in our Constitution. That's right. Where do you think they got it from? Uh-huh. Let me say it again. Our sins have been paid for. Jesus took the punishment and no sin can be paid for twice. Right. That's right. Our founding fathers understood this and in the fifth amendment to our constitution, they wrote in, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. That's right. Where did they get it? From the B-I-B-L-E. Got it from the Bible. Jesus made it quite clear. Look at uh, John five twenty four. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death unto life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, the word judgment that it, you know, in that verse is the same word for uh, condemnation that's found in Romans 8.1. Now, number two, number one, there is no punishment. Number two. The verse defines our position. No condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ. So that verse, number two, defines our position. Because you're born again, you become a brand new creation. And as I said recently, you are not the person who emerged from your mother's womb. Now, if you want to keep calling that home, you're crazy. (laughs) Your home is in heaven. That's where your home is. 
That's where around here we have to be careful when somebody says somebody went home. Because we say, which one? House here or home there? Because it's house here, it's home up there. Amen. Glory to God. You are new, you're different, you have a new position, you have a new identity, and in this new identity, you are not subject to condemnation. Glory to God. Your position is in Him. That phrase is used more than 130 times in the New Testament. Paul himself used in Christ Jesus 87 times in his epistles and in him several times more. There are only two spiritual conditions. You're either in Adam or you are in Christ. There is no in-between place. And which condition you're in is vitally important. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all are made alive. When you go outside and wherever you might go for lunch or wherever you might go or whatever might be happening with you, anybody who is not in Christ Jesus is dying. They're in Adam. The first Adam. Anybody you see, if they are not born again, there's a place marked for them in hell and they don't even know it. Are you listening? Dead or alive, there's nothing in between. Everybody you see, everybody in this room, you're either dead or you are alive. Amen. And you can only be alive through Christ Jesus. There is no other way. Amen. There is no other way. In Christ, you are a priest. You're royalty. You're secure. You're safe. You have eternal life. You will be rewarded by Jesus at the Bema seat encounter. Amen. Because there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Time for another shout. Yes. Hallelujah. Number three. We've been given power. Look at Romans 8, 2 through 4. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. But what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, which do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now there's a, we made a, 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 a shift here. Gone are the personal pronouns of I and me. Paul's full attention at this moment is on the work of the Holy Spirit in and through the believer. What the Holy Spirit will do in your life. Before this, the Holy Spirit was mentioned only twice in chapters 1 through 7. But in Romans, uh, in Romans uh, 1, 4, and 5, 5. In Romans 8, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 times in that one chapter. In, that, in these verses, Paul uses one word in two different ways. Pay attention. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, did you notice that the word law is not capitalized? Uh -huh. Look at it. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law. Both, neither of those are capitalized. You see it? That's because this is not the Torah that we're talking about here. Or the Ten Commandments. It's the word law like we would use to say the law of gravity. In other words, it's not a governing word. It's a principle. Are you following me? This is not a governing word. This is a principle. If you jump off a building, you go go splat. Over and out. Now, if you want to do it, go for it. That's the law of gravity at work. 
but there is nothing about it governing your life. Are you with me? It's the principle of creation. The law of sin is the same. The law of sin doesn't command you to sin. It's not a governing law. Listen to me. But rather it simply says that you were born with a sin nature as a descendant of Adam. Anybody following me? Look at verses 3 and 4. For what the law, notice the big L. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law, large L, capital, might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now the word law here is capitalized, you see it? Because Paul is now referring to the Torah that was given on Mount Sinai, the law of God. The Israelites told Moses, you go up on the mountain and talk with God and then we'll do whatever he tells you to do. You remember that? But they didn't, they couldn't because there were 613 commandments. And they couldn't fix it. They couldn't do it. Because within each of us, before we were born again, is the sin nature that brings condemnation. The law of sin. But look at what the Word says. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Not by us, but in us. Because Jesus did it for us. So let me say that again. All right. He condemned sin. The, the Word says that he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled. Not by us, but in us, because Jesus did it for us. Are you with me? It's not by your effort or mine. All our freedom comes by the Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, think of it this way. A Boeing 767 is made up of 175,400 pounds of metal. That's extremely heavy, <laughs> yet it flies. How? Because there is another little law. There is another law is enacted that supersedes the law of gravity. That plane soars into the sky, and the aerodynamic law of lift and thrust carries all that weight upward 300,000, I mean 30,000 to 37,000 feet above the ground. Paul said what the law of Moses could not do because of our flesh, and our flesh is weak, God did by enacting another law that would supersede the law of sin and death. That's the law of the spirit of life. Glory to God. So yes, these laws are here. Yes. The Lord just superseded it. He put one on top of it. Glory to God. Ooh, I'm having a good time. He sent his son, and after the ascension, he sent the Holy Spirit to do exactly what Jesus prophesied he would do. Look at it, John 16, 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Uh, Jesus also said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know that. That's in Acts 1.8. So the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's pretty powerful, church. And it's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that empowers us to walk the way Jesus walked. Amen. To talk like he's taught and to live like he lived. The Holy Spirit leads, the Holy Spirit guides, the Holy Spirit instructs, he convicts, he informs, he inspires, so that our spiritual life can continually develop into maturity. We grow, you and I grow by two principles, storage and contact. Amen. Let me help you. You store fuel in your car so that it will run when you need to go somewhere. 
storage. It's there. It's available. When you need it, you got it. And kind of a little childish manner of speaking, the Holy Spirit is stored in your spirit. Ready at any moment to take you where you need to go in the spirit. To propel you forward in the things of God. He's in you. He is stored there in you. He lives in you. Now, a hundred years ago, when there were trolleys were used for transportation more than buses or cars, the trolley stored no fuel. But from the roof of the trolley, metal poles reached up to connect with overhead cables. And as long as the metal poles connected with the cables, the trolley would go forward. Those metal poles are like our prayer and our time in the Bible. As long as we stay in contact Amen. with the power source, Amen. which is the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I go forward. Amen. We keep going. Storage and contact. Yes. Two ways we grow. So thus far we've said that there is no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Because we gave three reasons thus far. The punishment has been paid for. All punishment. There is no future punishment for anyone who is in Christ Jesus. There is no more punishment. Jesus took all of it. Second thing we said is our position has been defined. We're in Him. Third, we said we have power by the Holy Spirit. Storage and contact. Number four, last. The, our practice, the way we live. This should be a kind of a natural understanding if you understand the first three. Paul spells it out. Romans 5, I mean Romans 8, 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now here you come. This is where you need to be paying attention. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit on the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so and those who are in the flesh cannot please God however you're not in the flesh but you're in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you that means if you are not born again you do not you cannot please God there is punishment in store for you Could we put it that way However, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though, the body, body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. We know our bodies are constantly dying. We know that. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Glory to God. Now, so Paul contrasts two different kinds of people, the saints and the ain'ts. Got it? I'm trying to make this real theological. Real theological. Unbelievers are totally earthbound. Spiritually dead, living what Jesus described in Matthew 6. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Lord Jesus. In other words, we could put it this way. Believers should think differently, should act differently, should live differently. We should. We should. Think different, act different, live different. And if knowing there is no condemnation in store for you, 
doesn't motivate you to walk more closely and tightly with the Lord and more joyfully with the Lord, I don't know what will. Knowing that he has totally and completely taken all punishment and condemnation out of your life. Never to see it again. I'm talking about the craziness of how you live even. Never to see it again. He's made a provision through his blood to take care of you. And those of us who know him, who love him, when we do mess up, we don't want to mess up. We thank him and praise him for his blood and the cleansing power of his blood. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, since it's true that we will face no punishment, since it's true that our position in Christ is secure, since it's true that our power in the Spirit is dynamic, then the fourth principle is also true. We've been given the ability to live and walk in holiness. Yes. We can do it, yes. not by our own effort, yes, but by living close to the Holy Spirit. Yes. Listening to His voice, asking for divine guidance, yes. seeking His revelation, yes. reading His word. Yes. Maybe you've never thought of this, but the purpose of the gospel is not to make you happy. It's to make you holy. I can hear you now, but I want to be happy. Well, if you want to be happy, then live a holy life. You live a holy life, and people who live a holy life are the happiest people on the face of this earth. When our, when our behavior matches our position, we're happy. As we walk through life, sometimes we fall, but we don't stay down. Now, I'm on my way to the end. You noticed I didn't say I was there. <laughs> but I want you to really hear what I'm saying. As we walk through life, we may fall down, but we do not stay down. Whatever you do, don't live like the TV commercial that says, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Yes, you can. We're not talking about physically. We're talking about spiritually, which supersedes the spirit, the physical. Now listen carefully to me. Get up. Learn something from your mistake or failure. Grow up. Get up because of it. That's the process. That's the journey of holiness. You learn. You don't get in a, a little pity party and you don't carry on like a nut. The key is where's your mind? Some of you lost it a long time ago. <laughs> But the Bible says, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Don't throw a pity party when you fall down or when you make a mistake. Because as a man thinks in his heart, that's how you will become. You will. You can change your thinking. You change your life. Get up. Repent. Dust yourself off. Forgive yourself. And get back in the word. Knowing there is no condemnation for having fallen. There is no condemnation for having made a mistake. Is that not free? Is that not wonderful? No condemnation for falling, for making a mistake. Maybe a consequence, 
but no condemnation from the Lord God Almighty. What we have done to the Word of God is sinful. What has been taught from pulpits all over the world is sinful. We have made people, we have made God a bad guy. We've made he's going to get you for that. No, he's not. Not if you belong to him. He's going to forgive you. He's going to forgive you. Welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit when he comes. Repent. Make things right. Change or do whatever it is you have to do. But move forward in the freedom of knowing there is no condemnation. You know, that though you blew it, the Lord does not condemn you. I mean, everybody else may. Everybody else may act like, you know, make you feel you know, about two inches high. There's no person worth making you wish you were dead. That's right. God is the giver of life. Yes. Oh, we've done, made bad mistakes. And the worst part is facing yourself. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. And then we act like God's doing it to us. No, he's not. He's made provision to take the shame, to take the guilt. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. God forgives, he restores, and urges us to, Paul said, the prize of, because of the prize of the upward call. In Christ Jesus. I want to tell you something. Chapter 8 in Romans is a glorious beyond all. We're so given to condemning ourselves, aren't we? We're so easily negative toward everybody. Even ourselves. We focus on ourselves and our failures. While Jesus is saying, look at me. Look at me, son. Look at me, daughter. Why are you punishing yourself when I've already taken the punishment? Why are you doing that? Amen. Because we don't know him and we don't know his word. Because I think through the centuries that pastors and people have used control uh -huh. to beat people. Yeah. Oh, this is no, no freedom to go and sin. But it is a freedom in knowing that your God is a forgiving God. And he loves you and he's not going to get you and he is not mad with you. No matter what you have done, he is not. Why are we feeling so in insecure when we are totally secure in Jesus? Why are we telling yourself we are weak? When the greatest power in all of the universe lives inside of us. What is our problem? Do we remember that the Lord, that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead? Don't you think he can handle you? Well, the truth of the matter is we're so self-centered. No, we don't think he can. We're too tuned to us. Well. My blood never condemns you. The blood covers you. Amen. Let me close with this illustration. When three or four young men want to climb a mountain, they hire an experienced guide to lead them for several reasons. One is it's good sense. Hello, church. <laughs> the guide is experienced, and the guide knows what he's doing. Now, if you go climb Mount Everest, you know, all by yourself, I can do it. Or, you know, we'll pick up your remains or maybe we'll never find them. A guide is essential, particularly if the young men are new and never done any mountain climbing. They spend some time preparing and when they start climbing, the guide who leads the way, you know, 
He tethers the young climbers together, ties them together, chains them together, puts them all together, one after another with a heavy rope. As they climb, if any of them begin to slip or slide or whatever off the rocks, it's the lead guide's responsibility to keep them safe. Now, you would think if those below you begin to slip, slide, and go every kind of direction that you'd pull the guide down. That's not so. Guides are schooled and trained in the art of mountain climbing. And it's an art and a science so that they know what to do, they know how to do it, and the inexperienced climbers are tethered to them. They're tied to them. Now, again, if you're doing it by yourself, you're a nut. Now, our lead guide of the mountain of life is Jesus. We're tethered to him. We're tied to him. I'll assure you he knows exactly what to do when we start slipping. And he can save us from ourselves and he can save us from the enemy. The key is being tied to him, tethered to him, embraced by him, hooked to him, locked into him chained to him. Knowing as Roman 8 reveals to us that we will never face condemnation. We can trust our lead guide with all our hearts. We can walk free, confident, joyful, and victorious because death and defeat have been conquered on our behalf. All of it. All of it. And our glorious, amazing, powerful high priest, (laughs) our lead guide, will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He waits eagerly for the moment when we will join him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He provides the garment and no one comes without the right garment. And since there is no condemnation and since the blood has cleansed and purified us, we all are so welcome and we come with heads lifted up and we come, come and die. Glory to God. No condemnation, period. Amen? Amen. Amen. Glory, 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 glory. glory. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, glory, glory. Glory. Woo! And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I hope when you leave here today, you'll leave totally, totally different. Put your head up. Remember, look somebody in the eye. Maybe they will see Jesus and will want him because you are glowing. But when you go with your all hanging down and your lips all poked out, and carrying on like the end of the world is around your neck. What do you have to offer? He's in you. Give him room to come out. Glorify him. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, we praise you today. We thank you. We bless you. We praise you. No condemnation. Wow. 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 Is that not amazing? I think it's outstanding. I've spent most of my life condemned about something. Because I always was doing something wrong. (laughs) But guess what? Free at last. No condemnation. And because I am free, I want to continue to live free. And I want to share with somebody else. (coughs) Glory to God. What a God we serve. Amen. 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 Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. We give God all the glory. We give him all of the praise. He's a wonderful, wonderful God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to extend the rod over anyone who needs healing. If you believe in it, I believe, I receive. In the name of the Lord. The Lord said there was healing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Lord God. I believe. Therefore, I receive. And I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. We almost squished those almonds that are in here by faith. I'm believing, amen? I'm expecting to see them. I promise you before we get out of here. Hallelujah. Almonds. Ooh, glory to God. Glory to God. Father, we thank you and bless you today. We pray for our nation. We thank you, Lord God that we can trust you with the United States of America. Yes. We can trust you to put things in order. Yes. I thank you that we can trust you with your church. Yes. And Lord, I ask that the word that you gave this day will be the most freeing thing that we've experienced since our first encounter with you. Oh, thank you. We praise you with everything in us. You are worthy of all praise and adoration. We lift our hands and magnify and glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. We bless you and praise you. Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. For those of you who don't know, Maranatha means come, Lord Jesus, basically. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, Maranatha. Come, Jesus. Come. We don't have to be afraid to see him. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Have I told you lately how precious you are? You're wonderful, all of you. I'm so thankful for you. Honored me by being here and letting me preach to you. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. So soon, so soon. Glory to the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. Michelle, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, we don't, we don't want to just assume that you know the Lord. So if you're here and you've never given your life to him, I laid out the plan for you in the message. I gave the plan of salvation, believing the Lord, Amen. inviting him into your heart. He doesn't come unless you invite him. Right. Inviting him, wanting him to be Lord of your life, and asking him into your heart. We're not talking about joining a church. Amen. We're talking about giving your life to Jesus. Anyone. I'd love to lead you to the Lord. Anyone. Remember, if you're here and you don't know him and you walk out the door, that's another choice you made. He's crying out for you. He loves you. He already knows your name. And he wants you to come and live with him forever. He wants you to live without condemnation and guilt. Praise your Lord God. Michelle, won't you come? Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we thank you for what you have done for us through Jesus. Welcome back. 
Oh, we rejoice at your goodness. We rejoice at your favor towards us. I rejoice at your love for us. And that you would set it up, Father, so that as we are in you, Father, there is no condemnation. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Father, that we can walk in victory, we can walk in freedom. And Father, we can go out of this place, Father, knowing, Father, that you have set us free. Father, we've enjoyed being with you today. Father, you've been everywhere. You were here when we walked in. You were certainly here during praise and worship. And Father, what a mighty word you presented to us. Father, I speak blessings, Father, on, on my family. Father, we thank you as we go forth from this place, Father, that we hold our heads up, Father. And Father, that people see Jesus in us, Father, and that we can declare to them, Father, that we are free and that they can be free as well. Let us be a light as we go out. We thank you, Father, as we are with family and friends this, uh, this weekend, Father, that, Father, they'll see Jesus in us and let us shine brightly for you. Let us be quick to tell them about who you are. We thank you, Father, that your word says that we're supposed to tell the next generation. So, Father, let us do it, and let us do it well. We thank you, Father, for your presence that goes with us. I speak the peace of God upon each of you who are watching, each of you who are in the house. We thank you for, for your protection. We thank you, Lord, that you've blessed us, Father, and we choose to bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful 4th of July, a wonderful time with your families. No midday prayer tomorrow, but we will be in the house tomorrow night. If you'd like to join us, certainly is okay for you to be with your family. God bless.